Garoppolo fires. It is caught. Still on his feet is Kittle with a big play. And the stiff arm. George Kittle. Flags fly. He's down to the 30. What a run by George Kittle. David. Football. Football David. The Dave Damashek Football Program. Available on Apple Podcasts and at NFL.com slash DDFP. Now here's your host, Dave Damashek. Hi, hello, football fans. Welcome to the Dave Damashek Football Program, presented as always by our pals over at Zaxby's, home of the famous chicken fingers, wings, and salads. Go get you some, put them in your belly. You'll be better for it. It's the perfect way to celebrate the holiday season. That's uh, that's not their tagline. That's Damashek's tagline. All right, let's chop up week 14 and look ahead to week 15. A off week already that is uh, chock full of, of news now that the weekend has uh, has come and gone this uh, this middle of the week stuff so many storylines I want to talk about football not the off the field stuff either way we'll do both of that with the man seated to my immediate left one of our favorites here we're not in studio 66 we're remote in a conference room somewhere in NFL media here in the nerve center on the west coast in Culver City California I'm gonna talk to one of Eli Manning's best pals used to give him french fries on Saturday nights before the big <laughs> game it's Sean O'Hara oh I forgot to also mention your proudest honor, Browns legend, also a mm. digital wall of famer mm. in Studio 66, Sean O'Hare. How are you, fella? I'm swell. How are you, man? I, I, miss, I miss seeing that visual of that Browns jersey. It brings back a lot of good memories. But how fitting that we are remote in Conference Room 100 on the 100th year of the NFL. How fitting. Yeah, I guess so. A little bit of a reach, but I'll, I'll okay. allow it because right. you're feeling happy. I was trying. Yeah, you, hey, you said wings. Tommy like wings. You've got the perfect thing as a Giants guy. You, you, you got Eli. You got your old pal looking good, a nice send-off if we can assume that this is it for him as a New York Giant at least. Um, but, uh, but then also you lose the game ultimately, which is what you want if you're a Giants guy, right? It's interesting that you say that because um, I actually sent out a tweet asking fans what they would rather see in that game. Eli ball out and have a play lights out, have a big game, and the Giants lose. Or Eli not play well and the Giants win. Well, you're compet- if you're a competitor, then you want to win the game. But yeah. fans can yeah. be have a little distance and say it's better for us to have a higher draft pick, yeah. of course. Well, it, it, it was interesting, the responses, because what it meant to me, there were so many more responses for we want Eli to play well. Obviously, hmm. Eli play well and a win would be you know the cherry on the cake. But if anybody has been watching the Giants, things have not been going well the last three years. So um, in fitting fashion, yeah, Eli played well uh, in, in the first half, and the, the Giants actually looked – like a good team. And then if you are a Giants fan, you know that the wheels were going to fall off eventually, and they did in the second half. I don't know if they got a first down in the second half. But um, ironically enough, two years in a row, the Giants blew a large halftime lead down in Philly where they had a chance to come out in the second half and just let Saquon Barkley take over the game, and they did not do that. Hmm. All right, I want to talk more about the Giants, Eli, what's coming up there, who will be their head coach in 2020 and beyond. We'll let you speculate on those things. But let's not uh, stay football Giants focused here with so many other things going on. The first question I have for you, and there's Spygate 2.0. Some people are already calling it up in Foxborough or I guess in Cincinnati this one was. Uh, or was the game in Cleveland? Either way. The game was in Cleveland. It was in the state of Ohio. They either had, way. It was the Battle of Ohio, clearly. So I want to hear about that. But first, some actual football stuff. Um, I've been saying pretty much the whole season that as much as I love Patrick Mahomes um, and as exciting as he is, this thing's shaping up to be the early portion of Dan Marino's career, the early to mid-80s with the Dolphins, which is that he is a superhuman performer, astronomical numbers, the likes of which we've rarely have ever seen in the NFL. And yet, it's not going to ultimately obscure all the weaknesses on the roster. And people coming out of the game up in Foxborough now are saying, hey, look, the Chiefs' defense is legit. Look what they just did there. They look really good, especially as a pass defense. Um, look at you know, look out for this team now. Is that the case? Or is it what we were all talking about in advance of this game, that Tom Brady's offense stinks this year? Things are, are definitely tougher for Tom this year, obviously scoring points. I, I, you look back to last year, both games against the Chiefs, the one in the regular season and the AFC championship game, they were back and forth. And it was, hey, we score, you score, and just it was really who's going to end up with the ball last. This game had a totally different feel. But I'm not sold on the Chiefs' defense right now because if the refs don't blow that call 
on Nikhil Harry stepping out of bounds, that's a touchdown, and who knows? The Patriots go on to win that game. So it, it definitely had a different vibe, and we have seen the Patriots struggle offensively. But um, by no means do I say, well, the Chiefs have fixed everything. Um, but, but I also feel like Mahomes, he feels a lot like Aaron Rodgers his first couple it's of years good of dominating. Comp, right? And it's like, you know what? Aaron Rodgers, I mean, hands down, people are saying he's the best quarterback in the, in the league for a long time, and yet he didn't have a whole lot to show for it. He's got one Super Bowl ring. He's been hurt, banged up. Now that's creeping up on I'll Mahomes. interrupt you, though, to say this. The difference between those two is that Aaron Rodgers had, like, I mean, at his very best, the thing that people haven't given Aaron Rodgers sufficient credit for, in my opinion, is that uh, until Devontae Adams, who is his best pass catcher ever, until then it was it was like Greg Jennings or Jordy Nelson. At least Patrick Mahomes has Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey. Yeah, did he have driver at all? I, I don't know he, if had he had driver. driver Those guys are fine. Bit. None of them are yeah, Hall of so, Famers. I mean, Greg Jennings was a pretty pretty darn good They're receiver. They're all fine. They're yeah, pretty good. I mean, you know, Mahomes, um, you know, look, when you look at his receiving core, you know, I mean, he's got a lot of talent there, certainly a lot of speed, but um, – you know, I just look at, w- at what he's doing, putting up with these unbelievable numbers, the way he's doing it. I mean, the wow factor week in and week out. But yet you're talking about him in the same sense as Dan Marino. And it's ultimately, man, it, it really is a team game. And, and really, Mahomes, we could talk about how special he is and how good he is. But until he's in the big game, like he's, he, I think that's – he's going to be left out of that conversation like Marino was. Well, they, I mean, and also the numbers don't indicate that they're the same powerhouse. You don't have to know much more than to see the final scores versus last year's. They were obliterating, or at least they the defense stunk last year too, but they were putting up in the 30s, it felt like, every week. Now they're scratching out, you know, low to mid 20s okay is that going to be enough in the postseason I don't I still don't buy that this team can win three games and that's the way things are tracking for them now however do you think that the scariest team for the Ravens to see is those Chiefs because I think the Chiefs by the, if they go up to Foxborough again and that would be the if everything plays out after a wild card round and let's say the Patriots hold on to the second seed and the Chiefs are the third seed and they take care of Pittsburgh who is currently in the sixth seed if they would do that then that would be your matchup um I think the Chiefs would beat them in a rematch do you would beat the Patriots in a rematch the Chiefs beat the Patriots um even in Foxborough yeah, I think so, and and I think the one thing that, that that's kind of flying under the radar with the Patriots, we're talking about how much they're struggling offensively, and it's like, well, they don't their receivers are are, are not on the same page as Tom, and they don't have Gronk. Nobody's talking about the offensive line. They've been horrendous mm-hmm. last year. They had their guards, Shaq Mason and Joe Tooney, two of the best guards in the league last year. They lose David Andrews early in the season before it even started, actually, due to a blood clot. So they bring in Ted Karras. They traded for um, Russ Bodine. Before the season started, um, Karras out, hurt his knee, so now they got Ference in there. Ference has been getting dog-whipped, and hmm. that, that's tough. I mean, Tom Brady loves to step up in the pocket, and he can't because Ference is all over the – I mean, he looks like he's on ice skates. And then Isaiah Wynn was out for the first half of the season too. He just came back and played. They had Marshall Newhouse who was on a bus stop somewhere, you know, collecting tickets. So when you look at this offensive line for the Patriots, they have not played very well this entire season. That has led to a lot of the dysfunction. Um, so I think, the, yeah, I think the Chiefs have a good shot. Chris Jones was unblockable. I mean, he was yeah. a beast last year. He doesn't have quite the gaudy numbers this year, but they've been moving him outside and playing defensive end as well, and so that's changed his numbers. But this Chiefs defense is better this year than they were last and year, is no the, doubt. And is the O-line in case, I mean, in uh, New England – bad enough that we can because we've been down this road since in fact Tom Brady jokes with the we're on the Cincinnati he tweeted that out or put it on social media apparently Um, they've been on to Cincinnati for days now yeah well exactly apparently yeah apparently they had some advanced uh, videographers (laughs) at least on the Cincinnati but either way yes the the last when we heard the the famous catchphrase issued it was after the Chiefs beat the Patriots and yeah. what was that? Three Lombardies and ago, they were, they were two and two. I think. I know. Right? Well, we declared that Patriots team done, and that was at least six two. years ago now, yeah. right? Five, six years ago, and several Lombardies ago. Is this different this time? Is it done for the Patriots? Can they go to the Super Bowl, or do you think that between the Chiefs and the Ravens, and the way the Titans are playing, if they can sneak in, and we saw Deshaun Watson destroy them? just uh, a handful of nights ago. Are there too many teams that can take this team down for you to see the Patriots get into the Super Bowl? 
Well, I think one the one question that I always have is where are these playoff games being played? Because the G- Gillette Stadium is – I call it the Bermuda Triangle of the NFL. Hmm. Like teams go up there and they just disappear. It's like so true. Bad things happen. Punts get blocked. Shotgun snaps are going over quarterbacks' heads. I mean, it's just – stuff happens there that doesn't happen in any other stadium in the league, including headsets and all kinds of shenanigans. So equipment's not, you know, showing up. You know, it's – there's always something. So – if, they, if those games are in Gillette, I, I say Patriots still have the advantage. But the other thing, too, is, listen, if you're Bill Belichick, this is great. You know what the hardest thing to do as a coach is when your team is on a roll and they're kicking butt and taking names and you got to come in the team room and, and, and kind of chop everybody back down to earth. Mm-hmm. Hey, guys, stop patting each other on their back. Stop reading your press clippings. I know your Twitter's blowing up. I know your social media is on fire right now. But, look, we're not that good, and let me show you why. And it's like, hey, man, we've won eight in a row. So if you're Bill Belichick, if you're a coach and you – have a chance to come in and say, guys, we're not as good as you think you are. I know that everybody thought that the Patriots defense was like the 85 Bears and the 2000 Baltimore Ravens. They're clearly not good that for you. Same I've guy. been calling for some time, as Eddie Spaghetti there can tell you. The 85 Bears reference. We always have to update things for the kids, and yet the 85 Bears is the gold standard. And as I argue, little overrated not the defense but that 85 bears team is a scooch overrated and it it either way we have to update these things for the 21st century kids out there it's yeah. good for you you different, did the 2000 ravens di- different That's times good call. yeah and the numbers are different but you know totally different offenses too different rules as well so um but i think if, if you're the patriots and if you're bill belichick you, you love the fact that mm-hmm. look i don't have to prod these guys I don't, well they I don't did it a year ago fire you know they what? lost at the dolphins and they lost in pittsburgh yeah. and everybody said see they're not yeah. going to do it again that pittsburgh game last year was when everybody wrote them off and right. they had like five drops in that game and then you know what bill fired them up and they said look nobody thinks you guys can make another run let's go do it so i think the playoffs really the playoffs are not always about the best team winning it's about who's playing the best and, and who can get hot and that's if you can get your team to play their best football in those last couple of weeks in December and roll it right into the playoffs, that's where you, when you got them right where you want them. You don't want to peak too soon. We've seen the Chiefs do that how many times now? Andy Reid, I mean, he if there was an award for the best coach through first the first nine or ten games of the season, Andy Reid would win it every year. And then it's they funny you say that because that is one of the – I love talking about the cliches and how they're generally pretty empty and what do they ultimately mean. But that is one – that's one of the oldest cliches out there. You don't want to peak too soon. How does that happen? I mean, how, I mean and how can you manage that? I don't know how a coach could um, – sort of uh it's like trying to survive on only so much gas like oh we're, the, we're almost on empty and don't hit the gas too hard or else you're gonna burn more before we can get to the closest station and like how to meet that out you know how to that's a that's an interesting thing that people always talk about that but how would you properly be able to control whether or not it's, that happens it's definitely not a, an exact science you know there is no pythagorean theorem you can plug in there and say here's how we're gonna do it and this is why but it's you know you look at what Sean McVay is doing with Todd Gurley. All right, everybody's been saying, well, "Why aren't you using him? Why aren't you using him?" You know why? Because guess what? We used him last year, and he, he you know, he ran out of gas. Hmm. You know, we we were like Kramer in 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 the car with you know Costanza trying to figure out, can we go another exit? How many more exits can we get out of this guy? And then they're stranded on the side of the highway. So he's saying, "Look, I'm 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 not going to be an idiot. I'm not going to wear Gurley out in September and October because I want him at his best in December." And look what they're doing. They just beat Seattle. You know, the, the week before, they got a big performance from Gurley again. So it's like, you know what, 12-4 and four is great. And it's great to be the bi- have the bye week and all that other stuff. And everybody's saying that you're, uh, you know, boy wonder and you're a genius. But what really matters is, are my best players at their best when the playoffs come? You know, we got to get into the dance, obviously. But we've got to have fresh legs. And I, how do I do that? And I think that's why you see a, a lot of these teams, you know, f- they, they, they falter because they're just so happy to get there or – you know, they don't have that plan in place because they're just trying to get to the dance. And then it's like, hey, we're here. Guess what? I got no dance moves. But I, it's I also, it. as we've talked about, the other side of that coin is you don't want the pressure of being the team that's supposed to win. That's that's also not a great spot to be in. You want to have a devil-may-care attitude like, yeah. hey, we're happy to be here. But you also, 
um, the 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 end line can't be like the Bills two years ago when they got in. We made it. It's a miracle. Right. That was that was the measure right. of success for them, and that they lost the following week yeah. almost didn't matter to them. So or in the core, in like the Browns case, they were happy they went seven eight and one, and it's like here we go, we're on our way. Yeah, you know, you and then everybody, the world right. uh, apparently bought in. But that goes them. back to what I'm saying about success. Success sometimes is harder to handle as a coach and as a team and as players because everybody's like, hey, you know what? We're great. We're awesome. Guess what? I don't have to watch that extra bit of film that I, that I don't have to do what I did to get me there. And so, you know, Tom Coughlin had a, a board up in our team meeting room and it said practice and prepare as if you lost your last game. And that was always one of the hardest things to do as a, as a team is you got 53 guys. Everybody's thinking differently. Guys, I know we won eight in a row. Practice and prepare like you lost your last game. Because after a loss, everybody comes in, man, all right, what else do we got to do, man? You know, I got to spend 30 more minutes. I, I, I've got to be I got to be on point. Well, you win eight in a row, and next thing you know, you're doing podcasts with people instead of watching film. <laughs> I don't know why we deserve that uh, <laughs> that attack. That was an attack on you, I'm just saying. You know, sometimes nothing people Nothing to do with the end of your career. You know, they get on the banquet tour. <laughs> Well, I've also been on the banquet tour. See, that's why, because you know we like food. That's a, Clearly. That's what you and I have in yes. common is food. And then spaghetti, look at him. Jeez. I mean, with a name like spaghetti, you have to like food, right? Yeah. Um, let's stay then. You said, you said watching tape, so that leads us neatly then. What, what is the explanation for why would the Patriots – because people have said to me now – but nobody signals anymore. So what would you even be looking for if you're the Patriots, if you buy into the conspiracy theory or otherwise that the camera was locked on the Bengals sideline for eight straight minutes? What are they looking for conceivably? I have no idea. And to be honest with you, I have no idea how it would help you. You know, I mean, I, I've – listen, it's funny. Now on the other side calling games and, and, you know, covering games, I've been at practices. I've been at walkthroughs and, you know – very rarely can you see something that's like, wow, you know what? Okay, we're going to use that, and that's going to help us. You know, I mean, tendencies. Yeah, look, everybody's on. It's all on film. Like everybody, you can watch everything, and you know. So I, I, I mean, I, I think if this was any other team but the Patriots, this wouldn't even be a blip on the radar. But because it is the Patriots, it's a big thing, and well, now it's, right. it's it's a big deal. Um, you know, I, I don't know. It's very strange that this happened the week before they're going to play the Bengals. So that, to me, sounds very odd. Um, you know, and, and I don't know. I mean, there's there's so many conspiracy theories out there. But uh, as a player, I don't think seeing signals of what the other team is doing or what they're doing on their sideline, I don't, I don't think that would really change anything that, that we would be doing in our preparation or, or during the game. Do you think that they are on any level – considering because I keep talking about this the last month to the uh, to the anger and frustration of Patriots fans do you think that this is the end for them do you think the Giants your Giants say goodbye to Pat Shermer and otherwise and make a uh, whatever you need Bill Belichick we know that he has roots back to the Giants do you think that the Cowboys take a run at Bill Belichick do you think the Chargers or otherwise say let's go get Tom Brady and Josh McDaniels and see if we can give them one or two more years that way do you think that's it or do you think what Willie McGinnis floated a week ago and it was uh, he had a great little almost rah-rah speech for Patriots fans if I'm Tom Brady Willie said I go to to uh, Belichick and Kraft and I say one more year guys whatever I need uh, if I we need this offensive lineman we sign him we need this receiver we put it together we make one last run together and then we go in our separate directions I could see it happening I don't think Tom would ever meddle in personnel though you know, oh, I mean, no. I mean, I, I really, think, you don't think he says the stuff. You don't think you, you don't think he wanted them to resign Wes Welker. I mean, you go back and you look at all mm-hmm. the players. Logan Mankin gets traded. Dan Copen got cut like some of Tom's best friends and, and favorite targets, favorite players. They have cast aside and Tom wasn't happy about it. You know, I mean, publicly and privately, you know, he made that known. But I don't think he's meddling in personnel. But I, 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 I think that Bob and Bill are probably going to Tom saying, what do we need to do? to get you to come back for one more year. Absolutely. You don't think Belichick thinks I could do, you know what, the way Brady looks right now, and he does not strike me as somebody who's a loyalist who is indebted to Tom Brady for success. I think that Belichick wouldn't mind seeing how it would go if he had – I the name I keep throw, throwing out there just to make the point, the median QB is Andy Dalton. But, well, Andy Dalton, I'll, I'll show you how good a coach I am. I'll go win – I'll go make a deep playoff run with Andy. Maybe that's what they were filming. I mean, legitimately. I don't know. Right, maybe they were trying to get a little more insight on Andy Dolan. There you go. There's your conspiracy theory. I, I think when you look at Tom Brady, 
I still see him make unbelievable throws. He still had a chance to win that football game. I mean, there, how many drops had there were, those receivers had over the last few weeks? So I don't watch the Patriots on film and say, man, Tom has washed up. He, that's it. He's done. I think Tom would hang it up before he put himself out there like that because Tom cares about his TB12 brand too. And he's not going to go out there at, at less than 100. Bill won't allow it either. So I think there's a good enough relationship and respect there. They're not going to let that happen. But I think Tom's got another year in him. And I think Bill and Bob Kraft would come to him and say, take as much time as you need. Tom didn't participate in spring practice this year. I think he didn't. Hey, whatever you need to do, and I think he had an agreement with them that I'm not going to come to any of that stuff. I just, at this point in my career, I need to spend time with my family. That's the only reason that my wife will let me play another year. I think the same thing is going to happen. But to your point, I don't think Bill Belichick's leaving New England. And here's why. He has complete control. You, you go down to Dallas, not going to have that. You go down to the Giants, they're going to have a GM. They always have been. They wouldn't blow be. Gettleman out to bring Belichick in? I don't think so because now what do you do when Bill steps aside? Now you've got to reinvent the wheel and you've got to start that thing going again. Uh-huh. So I think if you look at these organizations, most people can't handle it the way that Bill handles it. And I think the way that that building is structured – Everything runs through him. That's the way that he wants it. That's why he left the Jets on that with that little napkin deal because he knew he was going to have final say in everything up in New England where he didn't have it with the Jets. I, I see. I want to talk about the off-field stuff, but the football ultimately is what uh, is what I find compelling. Who is the team then if it's not the Patriots? Because I really don't think it is. And and by the way, with that high-end defense that we all thought was generationally great for the first half of the season, the, they've played three good teams now in the last what five weeks or so, and each has taken them down. The Ravens. The I mean, the Deshaun Watson thing was a revelation to me that they whipped them. Maybe you can say, well, they all had the flu. And then Patrick Mahomes goes into Foxborough and, you know, didn't dominate them but still won the game, hung 24 on them. Is that even a strength that they can just lean on? Well, the defense will pull it out. I don't necessarily think that it's such a dominant defense that that covers up any other warts. They're not dominant the way that I think that the statistics are saying that they are. And and here's here's my case in point. The most dominant defense last year, Chicago Bears, guess what? They led the league in takeaways. Do the Chicago That's Bears look That's the trick now, right? Yeah, it's the takeaways. That that totally changes everything because now you're you're the scoring is down because guess what? They have half the possessions. You know, so you're taking the ball away from them. Maybe in a game you have six possessions, seven possessions. If you've got three or four turnovers in a game, you only have four opportunities to score now. And if you only score twice, you know, I mean, you look at at, the, at what they did the first half of the season. They were playing god awful teams with god awful quarterbacks. So the numbers are definitely skewed. But those takeaways are hard to sustain, and they totally inflate your team. They inflate the numbers. They inflate everything. So you look at the Bears. Mitch Trubisky was a Pro Bowl quarterback last year. Why? Because they were 12-4. and four. All right? Does, w- w- is anybody voting for Mitch Trubisky for the Pro Bowl this year? No. Same guy. That team looks totally different because they're not getting the takeaways. Different coordinator, same exact players. But every year it's different. And, and turnovers like that, you can't say, hey, they're going to continue throughout the playoffs. It does you feel – When you start playing better teams yeah. – Everything changes. It feels unsustainable, but that is the recipe for why the Pittsburgh Steelers are suddenly look tracking towards the playoffs. It's crazy, and I keep telling people that in Pittsburgh and outside, if yeah. your expectation is, oh, well, we should beat that team. The Steelers should go down to Arizona win. They should beat the Jets. There's no should beat anybody. Yeah. They don't. Well, they're playing the the third string free agent rookie. There's no except, and the only way it keeps going is not just to play really, really. Dominant defense, really strong defense by 21st standard, 21st century standards, you know, 15 points a game or thereabouts. You have to take the ball away consistently, and that's the that's the method by which I, I, I'm waiting for the, for the yeah. bottom to fall out on I that. I feel like the Steelers are actually a better defense than the Patriots. Mm. And statistically, everybody could prove me wrong with that, and no doubt about it. You probably have plenty of information. But the Steelers, their takeaways are different in my mind, because of how they're getting them. They are getting takeaways and turnovers because they're getting pressure on a quarterback. Mm. They're getting after him. It's sack, force fumbles. It's quarterback getting hit, and that's how the interceptions are happening. The Patriots, all their takeaways were tip balls, bad throws, interceptions by corners, safeties, linebackers in coverage. The Patriots don't have anybody up front that scare you. I mean, every down it may be a different guy coming free because of a scheme, 
But the Steelers have guys that you've got a game plan for. We've got where is TJ Watt? When you break the huddle, where's 90? There he is. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about Bud Dupree? Where's he at? Oh, okay. By the way, we're going to fan out on both sides to give helps our tackles. Well, guess who's one on one now? Cam Hayward. And he's putting the guard back in the lap of the quarterback. So they've got legitimate ass kickers up front, which to me changes everything on the back end. I mean, yeah, they're 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 putting eight guys. They're dropping eight guys now, with uh, very often, and and still getting to the QB yeah. doing it that way. Yeah. TJ Watt, defensive player of the year at this point, right? I'm hard um, to hard to. I mean, he should definitely be in the category. Who else would it be at this you know, point? Shaq Barrett has kind of fallen off. I think Chandler Jones is leading the league in sacks right now, so that's always a big factor. Oh come on, we're not um, going to give it to a team a guy who's on a team that's Stephon Gilmore. And Stephon Gilmore. Gil- Gilmore. Uh, I mean, I tell you, it's hard. Uh, I think. I feel like as a corner, it's such a hard award to win because the sacks kind of. Because if you get got, it's one of those things. If you get got one week, then people will point to that. Yeah, but New Hopkins worked yeah. him over that one week. Yeah, and I mean, you, you look can at go it, a couple weeks without a sack and still stay in the mix for yeah, for that award. Jamie Collins was probably in the conversation. I would agree a, with that at ago. some point. I think right. Jamal Adams was probably creeping into the conversation before he got hurt. Um, you know, Bobby Wagner, I feel like, is kind of always in that conversation. Um, you know, it, it does feel like the sacks are a little bit down this year. Like Aaron Donald doesn't have the big numbers that he that he had last year. Um, Chris Jones as well. They both were, were candidates for that. Um, yeah, it, it feels like it's very competitive this year. It's, it's pretty wide open. Let me throw this. I'm jump, jumping all over the place because I want to get to a bunch of stuff here before we, uh, before Logan we Ryan, finish it up. Logan Ryan's kind of a guy under the radar that, that oh, should be. Oh, come on. We're getting, not going to do that, though, right, are we? Uh, I mean, it's he, a good. That's kid, fine. Kid's balling out. Is somebody that nobody's talking about. It's true, and he's the rare exception that proves the rule that when you leave the Patriots, you stay good. Almost nobody does that. Right. That's except, one of the f- except when you go to Tennessee Titans, who were led by Mike Vrabel, who was a Patriot coach. Ah, yeah. You know what? Vrabel, I keep skipping over him. I always say Bill O'Brien is the gold standard of uh, of the Belichick coaching tree, but I guess mm-hmm. Mike Vrabel is closing in on that and uh, is going to steal that award. And in he, fact, and, it's the and, Belichick and, Bowl twice in the next in the final three weeks yeah, for the AFC South. 100%. Who's going to get that, by the way? Tennessee. Tennessee. You think yeah. they go down to Houston this week? Here's the path. Houston goes. They have Tampa plus uh, two with the with the Titans. Right. Tennessee has Pittsburgh goes. Um, Bills on Sunday night in Pittsburgh. Um, then at the Jets, and then they finish with the Ravens. And the good news for the Steelers with that is, if the Ravens keep winning, they aren't going to need Week 17. And I think in talking to uh, Jeff Zerebiak, uh, among others, with the with the Ravens, yeah, the beat writer there, Lamar. that they're not going to throw Lamar no. out there against that no. defense. You Let, wouldn't want a team that needs the game. You wouldn't yeah. want to throw him against that. Let uh, Trace McSorley c- go right? cut, his, cut his teeth. Or RG3, either way. I'm they not, wouldn't run I wouldn't put RG3 out there because I don't want him to get hurt because now if something happens to Lamar in the playoffs, then you have to play <laughs> McSorley. So play McSorley Week 17, save RG3 and Lamar. I think that the Ravens, as much as I think that they're going to the Super Bowl and and based on the numbers and, and historical um, evidence would indicate that a team doing what they're doing in terms of margin of victory and all that kind of stuff um, and getting one of those buys and it shaping up that it's likely all going through Charm City to get to the Super Bowl. But I think that there are – I do see – teams rightly that could beat them if the weather's right I could see Patrick Mahomes going in there and just and just dropping it on and just you know breaking their hearts in the span of four minutes like all of a sudden it's like oh whoa he just hung 14 on us in the middle of the second quarter and now we got to figure out how to rally the other one is the Buffalo Bills I think the Bills based on what we just saw on Sunday because they will be liberated from any expectation if they have to go in let's say they they uh, go on the road and they win a wild card round game. And they're not even out of contention yet for the AFC East. But let's say they win their first round game. If they go into Baltimore in the second, they, they are not. there will be no pressure on them to win. It will all be – and and really in a lot of ways, the Bills are kind of like the the Ravens. You know, I know they're not running the same proper offensive attack, but 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 you can see the similarities kind of in uh, yeah. in the two teams. In a different way. Um, they both have quarterbacks that are really tough to, to take down in, in their own different way. I, I think Buffalo has a scoring problem, and, and, and mm. that showed up against Baltimore in that game. And – Really, what they what 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 showed up is that they don't have a third down answer. If you take Cole Beasley away, which they did, um, Josh Allen was lost, and 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 now, if he can't beat you with his legs, I, Josh is not. If you're going to ask him to throw the ball 40 times in a game, you're that's a, that's an L. So Buffalo, they have to they have to get the lead. They've got to find a way to grind it out. 
like they beat the Cowboys. Um, so I, I think that's why I like Baltimore over Buffalo in that conversation because Baltimore has shown that they can light it up. Now, what we haven't seen from Baltimore is this year, we haven't seen them down early. We haven't seen them mm-hmm. have to say, you know what? We, we no, really we can't. did. It was way it was against, long ago against yeah, it was like KC. Week three, right? It was right. That, it was that's the City. one. And I, I keep saying, and that you happened know, last year too. And you remember the Jenga theory that if you if you take the wrong guy out, I don't know why this is true, but when the Ravens have Jimmy Smith and then they throw Marcus Peters in too, but when Jimmy Smith is in there, the defense is different. So I don't even yeah. think you can hang that much on what we saw in September. But that's your that's the, your evidence. The other the other thing that makes me lean towards Baltimore is their offensive line is playing so much better mm. than Buffalo's, and Baltimore has overcome losing their center. Um, you know, he, 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 he went down with an ACL, and they've had their backup center come in there, but they haven't missed a beat. But Baltimore's offense line, their tackles, Ronnie Stanley and Orlando Brown are phenomenal, and they're just smashing people. Mm. Marshall Yonda, Bradley Bowes on the left guard, they're doing a great job. So I like their offensive line. I like their ability. Say in the playoffs, you never know, okay? You want to play Buffalo? You want to play Baltimore in January? It could be a blizzard. It could be, you know, a sloppy conditions. I like Baltimore's ability to win a game like that. Well, you know, that that it now all of a sudden, if the Bills can vanquish Pittsburgh on Sunday night, the division can be theirs. I think. I'm not 100% sure Buffalo, though. Buffalo Buffalo's got to beat New England. Yeah, if they, if they the beat division. Pittsburgh and then beat yeah. New England, does that give them the division? Do you know off the top of your head there, Spaghetti? That would be interesting. Why isn't your microphone on, Eddie Spaghetti? Just keep your microphone on. Because I don't want to breathe into it. I'll let you guys are doing the talking. Well, you can jump into our conversation. I'm I, sure you I, have some Giants-related questions uh, at least. I got, and, a, I, got know, a, I got a lot of Giants thoughts. That going on. bum <laughs> NFC East. It's we, an we did kind of we did kind of gloss over Eli. We'll get and, to it, but uh, I want to okay. talk about a couple okay. things quickly. First of all, give me the pick on. Give me a couple things quick. Bills Steelers. Who wins that game? Bills Steelers. Um, Cause that Matt, I mean the defense, the, the the pass I like, rush. I like I like I like the Bills winning that game. Do you? Like I, I'm, you know, the Duck Dynasty is not there yet. So I, I think this Bills defense is legit. I mean they 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 harass Tom Brady. Um, look, the Steelers beat up on the Arizona Cardinals. Kyler Murray is as athletic as he, as he is. He's the most sacked quarterback in the league. So that offense is still going through a lot of growing pains. But I think Buffalo. They are a tough out. They are physical. I wasn't throwing shade on their offensive line. They do want to play smash mouth football. I really like Cody Ford. He's been a big addition to them. Um, I think their left tackle, Deion Dawkins, is, is has done a really good job. And I think John Brown, Cole Beasley, like they've got some things going on for them offensively, but their defense is really driving that chip. So I, I think this could be a really tough game offensively for the Steelers. Well, they do get back Juju. Smith Schuster and they get back James Conner and they have been surviving throwing the ball to James Washington and Deontay Johnson and the like and you wonder if those guys who otherwise wouldn't have gotten the touches wouldn't have gotten the targets have then have have now elevated and are a different level than they otherwise might have been had Juju been healthy this whole time I wonder if that makes a fact if that's a factor but I'm with you in all likelihood there and then it raises the specter of the might the Bills actually pass the Patriots and win the division and send the Patriots certainly on the road? And even if they do win, if they're a three seed, the Patriots, if they fall back and the Chiefs catch them, now they have no wiggle room. They lose a game and the Chiefs uh, win out, then then they're certainly a road team for three. And there's zero history of Tom Brady and the Patriots uh, running the t- winning three games to get to the Super Bowl. Quickly, Baker Mayfield talking bad about uh, his own um, – the medical staff, big deal or no? Just dumb. Just dumb. Just dumb. You know what? Like, you, you, you got to – there's a way to handle things like that. Hey, look, I don't talk about other players, and I certainly don't talk about other players' injuries. Like, the, the rule number one as a player, you don't talk about other players. Is it getting to be now almost two full seasons in? Everybody makes it – well, he's fiery. Is it too much now? Or is it? Is there something – is he going to take a turn that, and I get mean, more mature because he is whatever he is, 24, I'm guessing, or thereabouts? Or is this Baker Mayfield and, and – and, uh, and deal with it. Look, it's okay to have an opinion. It's okay to 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 I have agree thoughts usually. and all that stuff. But as a quarterback, you got to keep them to yourself. And it's not about being fiery. It's not about hey, man, this is who I am, and I'm not going to change. No, no, you know, you 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 don't have to change, but you have to filter it. And huh. That's it. And if I'm Freddie Kitchens, if I'm the Browns, look, this is what we're expecting of you because you, when you speak. It's louder than any other player here, and it resonates, and it and there's a ripple effect. So you need to understand that. Did you have in – was your intentions good? Yes. My dad used to always tell me, the road to hell is lined with good intentions. All right? That nobody cares about what your intent was. You, say, you, you talk 
bad about your training staff, the fact that you didn't think that that was going to be taken in a bad way, that worries me more than actually what you that's said. That's exactly right. You, 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 that's exactly right. No one considers themselves. I'm not saying Baker Mayfield is evil or bad or anything, but yes, nobody. That uh, that's a good reminder always for the human condition. Nobody considers themselves evil. I'm doing this to be evil. Right. Be- uh, no, I was. People I, think I, that they're I wasn't doing. Wasn't trying to be mean. I wasn't trying to throw an yeah. interception. But you shouldn't throw that ball into that window because you know bad things you, can I happen. I mean, there are a couple As times a quarterback, you've said your some... job is to take care of the football. As a quarterback, your job is to take care of the franchise verbally. You and Maurice and some other people have intentionally been mean to me before. But I mean, but like I mean, for the most part, you don't go out of your way to do it. Yeah, but that's just because nobody likes you. That's not because we're Fair. Not trying to be nice. Fair. I don't like myself, so, I'm, <laughs> so I agree. Um, Levy and Bell, um, did you ever – you're an Iron Man. I don't think you ever missed an NFL game. But um, I did. you ever heard I anything like this couple. before? Um, like, he's no, sick. Like, I, yeah, you're not playing. You're not playing. All right, I'm going to go bowling late night. <laughs> Like, <laughs> what, I mean, the, what is he doing? I, I, I don't know. I mean, no one's going to see you, Le'Veon? Le'Veon? Le'Veon Bell, like the things that have transpired over the last year and a half have really made me feel differently about one of the best running backs that this league has seen in the last 20 years. Like we should be talking about the greatness that Le'Veon Bell is and was. And instead we're talking about all this other nonsense. And it's really it's a shame because – when you look at what he was doing in Pittsburgh, it was unbelievable. Hmm. I mean, he Seems was almost like you're talking about another skill it, position it, guy who played in Pittsburgh for a stretch it, there. It, yeah, it does. And 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 listen, those two obviously were in cahoots, you know, and and they they, they cared more about themselves. It, it's a team game. And you know what? If you it's okay to care about yourself. Go play golf, go play tennis, go be a swimmer. But this is a team game. And when you step into a huddle, the reason why the huddle is a circle is because we're all looking at each other and it's the circle of trust. And we're all counting on each other. And I'm counting on you to be your best. If you're sick and you can't play, listen, we get it. <laughs> get right, all right? And, and, and as a player who misses a game, you should be so disappointed and distraught that you don't get to go out there with your teammates, with your brothers, that the last thing on my mind the night before a game, even if I wasn't playing, was to go out and do something. I was scared to go out to dinner on a Friday night if I was hurt because I didn't want to be out on my feet. In New York, of I course, somebody's anybody, gonna see you, you know, right? Yeah, you're not gonna. I mean, people are gonna find you. They're gonna see you, but you should be getting treatment if you're sick. Or you should be at home getting getting rest. I mean, stay out of the gutter. Has anybody even asked the most important question? What did you bowl? Was it even worth your time? Because if you broke 200 now, that now, I mean, that's good bowling. You know, like uh, he was 26, and then Jerome Bettis was 36. He was a high end bowler. I think he's even bowled a 300 before. Creep, Spaghetti, creep, we gotta go. Creep can roll, man. It's getting, it's getting to that time. Yeah, it's Sean. getting to that time. Okay. All right. O'Hara's got to go do his fancy TV show. So let's wrap it up here then. Um, just trying to make sure we got everything. Boy, the way it's hey, spaghetti. I told you the 49ers are going to go down there and beat that Saints team. Now they have. Who do you think winds up with the number one seed? O'Hara. Quick answer. You got the Packers in the mix there. The Saints have fallen to three, but of course the Niners still have to play up in Seattle. And the way these things can bounce all over the place if Seattle beats San Francisco, then I the the big benefit. But also the Packers now at the two seed still have to play in Minnesota, and Minnesota conceivably could fall out of the playoffs, and they can still win the division. The Packers are very unlikely to fall out of the picture, but if Minnesota loses that game to um, Green Bay and the Rams win out, the Rams can still sneak in the back door. There's still much to to be determined here is the point. Give me your number one seed in the NFC because, to me, this is massively important. If New Orleans, if it's in the Superdome versus uh, anywhere else, it's a it's a huge difference um, for that side of the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a two-dog race, really, between the 49ers and the Saints. Um, you know, look, the Packers, I mean, they, they, they've got the Bears and the Vikings, like you said. Those are, those are two tough outs. But I, I still think, even though they lost the game, the Saints, to me, still are built to win out and, and to win in the playoffs more than the 49ers because the 49ers just, even though they won the game, they lost the battle. They lost their starting center, Western Richburg, Torres Patella. That's going to be tough to replace. Ben Garland did a great job filling in, but now it's different. All right, Now we've lost our sixth man. They've already been banged up with Staley, with McGlinchey. Um, D. Ford uh, tweaked his hammy again. Sherman tweaked his hammy. So they're, they're coming out. He's they're, out they're, for a while. They're limping right? out of that W, um, which kind of scares you because, like you said, they got to play Atlanta, they got to play the Rams, and then they got to go to Seattle. Now, 
the 49ers, they're kind of that charm team right now, right? Or actually, they, they, when you look at, at that win right there, that was a huge win for them because they should have beat Seattle. Right. Right. They lose that game because the kicker misses the field goal. So I think they're the best team in the NFC, but I think the Saints could end up being the number one seed. I, I, I'm kind of with you, but I also – well, I, well it's, so let's uh, get back to where we started this conversation. Um, so you think the Titans do end up getting in. Pittsburgh falls out, and the Bills get the five seed is how you is how you see that one? Yeah, I think the Bills get in. I think Tennessee gets in. I don't like your talk. By the way, Derrick Henry is uh, – with that hammy, if he goes out, how massive is that? Can Ryan Tannehill – can they be a throw-it-all-over-the-place team without – uh, without uh, the big guy behind them, no, I don't think they're going to become a throw it all, you know, throw it all over the place team, and I, and I think that definitely changes um, that run game a little bit. Deion Lewis, though, I tell you what, he filled in for Derrick Henry when Derrick Henry has missed a couple times. Uh, Deion Lewis runs hard. Now the question really is, if Derrick Henry ends up missing some time, will they still stay patient with that run game? Because that is what has opened things up for Tannehill. Tannehill's I mean, they're not going to give Deion Lewis 20, 25 carries, though. I mean, you, you almost have to just to protect Tannehill. And I think when, the reason why Tannehill looks so good right now is because he's been extremely accurate, but the big chunk plays are there because of that run game because, because of what Derrick Henry's doing. Um, and then last thing, Eli Manning, a starting quarterback in 2020? I think this is it. Do you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Eli would love to play. Um, I don't know if he can wholeheartedly put on another uniform. And I think playing for the New York Giants has meant more to him than just the job title and just being the quarterback of an NFL team. So um, I think he would he would love to play uh, another year or two. I think he still loves preparing. He loves everything that it takes to get ready for a season. Uh, but I, I just don't think at this point in his life and his career with his family, you know, I, I don't see him going somewhere else to try to try to spark a two or three year run. And also practically, re- where really is that spot? I mean, maybe what's what's a funny, neat, little ironic uh, completion of his pro circle would be to go to the Chargers, I guess. And that would be I, – I, I just don't know that the I think, Chargers – we already know how Eli feels about the Chargers. Still? He still feels that way? He yeah. still – he wouldn't want to throw to Keenan Allen? All right, well, I'm holding out hope to see some big-name guy go there because I assume Phil's on his way out. I don't know where Phil's going to land next year. I mean, if you're the Chargers, are you going to go from Phillip Rivers to Eli Manning? I mean, that's – No, I'm just – I no, I don't know. I, I wonder where they're – what NFL team is looking at either Eli or even Phil the way he's I mean, uh, played this year and like, said, like, oh, yeah, that'll fix us. That, that's like trading a, an 85 sheepdog in for a for a, for a, a, a moped or a, uh, you know, a little scooter. Oh, I'm definitely telling Eli you, and Phil you, get, you said you, that. And even if you can get 70 miles to the gallon on that hog – so you're not a big duck guy, huh? That's my takeaway from this entire conversation. You're not you're not in on the duck experience. It's very exciting. Look, if you, do you it, see they're liberated from expectation? The one, don't you see that the there's no thing, supposed to there? That's I, what's great. No, I don't want my quarterback's nickname to be duck. That means as an offensive lineman, I'm not doing my job. <laughs> you know what I love is that you stick with your brand. That's the best that you constantly with every que- every team we we went over here, you touch on the offensive line and it's not jive that that is unsexy as it is. We always make that point that the teams that make the not get into the playoffs, the deep playoff runs consistently control both sides of the line of scrimmage. That if you go through the last 10 15 years, the teams that you often find in that final four are like, "Oh, why yeah. are they with that doesn't seem like they have the great skill guy. Well, who's yeah. their number one? It doesn't matter. They they dominate. Yeah. They can run on you when they want to. Just you look, don't get to their QB. They yeah. get to your QB. That's basically just look at the old lines in the Super Bowls last year. That's right. It was the Rams. Their offense line was kicking butt, taking names. Patriots. I mentioned how good their guards were last year. They played phenomenal. The year before that, it was the Eagles. You know, they they had an unbelievable run game. Their offensive line played really well. Um, it's a no brainer. I could go on and on with O'Hare. We didn't even get into food or anything, Spaghetti. Yeah, well, you know what? You ask off the air. You ask uh, O'Hare all your uh, sure. New York football Giants related <laughs> yeah. questions. Bring it. Um, but uh, thank you very much, O'Hare. Thank you, Eddie Spaghetti. And thank you, the listener, for listening to this uh, one-day-delayed uh, Dave Damashek football program. We appreciate you checking it out. We'll be back already tomorrow with another episode for you with the Week 15 Game Picks Red Challenge flag style with Matt Money Smith and, uh, oh, not Handsome Hank. He's out tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah, want to come by, O'Hare. You're more than welcome to pop in there. All right. We'll look forward to seeing you on Good Morning Football on Saturday again. And uh, and with all that being said, thanks to Zaxby's as well. Talk to you tomorrow. Until then, thanks so much, football fans. It's been a thin slice of heaven.